Hello and welcome to the Washington Institute. I'm Rob Satloff, the director, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this special policy forum event to examine terror and turbulence in Israel and the West Bank. There has obviously and regrettably been a surge in terrorist attacks over the last couple of weeks, 11 Israelis dead. There have been uh, raids throughout um, uh, the West Bank and, and in different cities. Um, there's heightened security throughout Israel and the territories. And of course, we are now in the month of Ramadan and we are approaching the confluence of Passover and Easter. So uh, we are today going to take a look at what is behind this rise in terrorism, what it portends for the weeks ahead, what it means for the Israeli government and the Palestinian Authority, and what, if we take a step back, is or should the United States be doing about all this? But before that, just a couple of words of logistics. First, an announcement. Uh, next week, on Monday, April 11th, I, uh, I ask you to please mark your calendars. We're going to have a very important policy forum with Israel's Minister of Defense, Benny Gantz, one-on-one -on -one conversation with the Minister of Defense at 11 o'clock Eastern time. Um, uh, that will be, I think, a very informative and uh, uh, insightful discussion on these and other Middle East security issues. If you want to participate in today's discussion, if you want to get your question into the conversation, you have two ways of doing that, depending on how you're accessing this conversation. If you're on Zoom, please use the Zoom bar at the bottom of your screen uh, to send a question um, using the Q&A function. If you're on YouTube or any other way that you're you're part of today's event, please email me directly at rsatloff at washingtoninstitute.org. That's R-S-A-T-L-O-F-F -F at washingtoninstitute.org. All right. Today's discussion, I am really delighted to have three outstanding panelists. First, from Israel, um, we're going to hear first from Anna Ochrenheim. Anna is the military and defense correspondent for the Jerusalem Post, been covering um, current events, been covering more broadly um, security and military issues um, in Israel, but has had a uh, close finger on the pulse of what is going on in terms of this rise of terrorism. I'm really delighted that Anna can join us uh, virtually from Jerusalem. Thank you very much for being with us, Anna. Uh, second, will be my colleague, Matt Levitt, um, sitting here in Washington with me. Matt is the Institute's Fromer Wexler Fellow and Director of our Reinhardt Program on Counterterrorism and Intelligence. He returned just a few days ago from uh, this part of the world, uh, where he met with quite a broad array of senior security figures and has insights from that experience. And at the end of the table is another of my colleagues, Rachel Omeri a senior fellow here at the Washington Institute, former member of the Palestinian negotiating team with deep insights into Palestinian and Israeli-Palestinian politics. And so we have lots of different aspects of, of this issue um, covered. And we're going to begin our conversation by turning to Anna for some remarks from Jerusalem. Anna, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, we're having this... Uh, forum actually on a day that was relatively quiet in Israel, um, but after a night where Palestinians fired numerous shots at several uh, settlements um, in the West Bank near Jerusalem. But uh, despite the fact that it is relatively quiet, uh, security forces have been conducting almost nightly uh, arrests around the West Bank um, in Palestinian villages, cities, towns, at least 15 uh, terror attacks are said to have been thwarted. Uh, that's what Prime Minister Naftali Bennett said today during a, a briefing at the Central Command. Um, and just to put that in perspective, IDF Chief of Staff Kohavi said yesterday that 10 attacks were thwarted. So within one night, five uh, 
Presumably large attacks were thwarted by security services. Uh, close to 300 Palestinians have been arrested within the past week alone. Um, but we have not seen any attacks against Israelis and no Israelis killed or injured um, since the devastating attack in Bnei Brak. At the same time, um, just a, an hour or so ago, uh, the Israeli military and defense establishment announced that they will not be imposing any significant uh, closures on the West Bank for Ramadan, um, even allowing Palestinians into Israel for family visits, allowing Palestinians to go to the Temple Mount for prayer. Uh, of course, uh, depending on on, uh, on your gender and age, there could be uh, restrictions, but not something we haven't seen before in Israel uh, to to come and visit the Temple Mount, but there hasn't been really any significant um, restrictions other than the nightly security forces going into villages, which goes on even when there isn't a rise in violence. Uh, so what we're seeing here is a mix really of, uh, yes, there are tensions, there is a heightened alert by security forces, there are more uh, police on the streets or even on the promenade of Tel Aviv or in, you know, um, the market in Jerusalem, you, you do see that presence and you do feel that, um, that heightened alert. I was in Northern Israel uh, this weekend staying at a, at a boutique hotel and I saw a few people carrying uh, weapons uh, to breakfast, which I don't usually see uh, these days. So you do feel it, but at the same time, there isn't really... Um, other than, again, what I said with, with, with the arrest, you don't see uh, security forces going in during the day, for example, unless they have really a ticking bomb that they want to, that they want to stop. Uh, like there was a, a cell, um, a Palestinian Islamic Jihad cell that was thwarted uh, by Israeli uh, Yamam and uh, Shin Bet forces the other day. We also aren't seeing any tension from Gaza. We aren't seeing any threats by Hamas to fire rockets uh, like we saw last year in May. Uh, we're even not seeing anything from Palestinian Islamic Jihad to avenge the deaths of, uh, of their militants in the West Bank. So it, it's a very interesting mix, but I think the Israeli security establishment is really trying not to have a repeat of May of last year. Uh, what we also saw in May, uh, which we hadn't seen before, were, were the riots within the mixed uh, Israeli uh, Arab uh, cities and Israeli security forces have told me that they're ready, they're on alert for more riots to break out should there be an even further deterior deterioration. But right now they're really playing it, uh, they're really tiptoeing lightly around that because they don't think that it could deteriorate if, even further. And that's why the de defense establishment decided today to not impose even further restrictions. They want the situation to calm down. They want to break this wave of terror, and that's why they're calling it Operation Break the Wave. Um, when it comes to, to arresting uh, Palestinian suspects, the Israeli defense establishment has a thing about naming their operations, whether it be Operation Guardian of the Walls or Pillar of Defense, and now Break the Wave. Uh, very creative. But uh, I, I do think that they're trying very hard not to have the situation escalate into war uh, because it's something that in this region, especially in Israel, one small spark can touch it all off. And I think that uh, Bennett um, and Defense Minister Gantz and IDF Chief of Staff Kochavi and the Shin Bet Head Ronen Bar are really aware um, that that's something that they can't afford especially with the Bennett government um, really trying to also mediate with Ukraine, they can't mediate while at the same time deal a war within Israel um, coming from Gaza, the West Bank, and the Israeli uh, Arab city. So I think that's something that uh, we will see taper off, um, but only towards the end of Ramadan, meaning there's going to be a month of uh, heightened alert, high tensions, and, and people um, carrying their weapons, which we haven't seen in many, many years. Okay, thank you. Um, Israel tiptoeing around uh, this moment of tension, trying to 
um, uh, not exacerbate the tension, hoping that the month passes without an explosion as we saw last year. Thank you, Anna. Um, Matt, how does this sound to you? Uh, a little dangerous, um, but I'd like to take a step back and kind of put this in a little bit of context. Um, first of all, I think that a lot of people were very surprised that the violence that kicked off this recent wave um, didn't come from Hamas. In fact, it came initially from people who were claiming affiliation with the Islamic State, two individuals, uh, one in the Mid-North, one in the South, uh, who were already known to Israeli authorities, uh, had previous arrests, et cetera. And I think in the first few days, that kind of prompted a whole lot of speculation about whether there was a new Islamic State threat, whether this was tied to uh, the new head of the Islamic State, whether the Islamic State was on a new anti-Israel campaign. Um, we don't have evidence for any of that. We don't have evidence that these two Islamic State claimed attacks were in fact any way uh, connected or coordinated. And I think it has a lot more to do with the fact that there is a um, uh, an alignment of the stars in a kind of dangerous way that uh, brought us to a point of violence. Uh, first of all, Hamas has been preparing for renewed violence of a kind that is focused on the West Bank and on Israel and very much not on the Gaza Strip, trying to keep the Gaza Strip as an island of calm ever since Guardian of the Walls, the operation, uh, the name the Israelis gave the operation last May. And they didn't wait very long uh, to, to kind of set that in motion. You saw already in July, just a few weeks after that conflict, uh, um, rounds of raids of Hamas operatives in the West Bank. You saw uh, several dozen more, 50 something uh, persons um, arrested uh, at the very end of, of last year, just a few months ago. And you've seen, I think, more importantly, for the purpose of understanding how it is that others even outside Hamas might have kicked off this violence, you see in particular on WhatsApp and on Telegram, a very sharp increase in incitement towards violence, towards the idea that only Hamas is protecting uh, the defenders of uh, uh, Jerusalem. And for that matter, only Hamas is kind of stepping up, understanding the kind of true Palestinian identity of um, Israel's Arab citizens, Israeli Arabs. I think also there has been a, a lot of tension within uh, the Palestinian community. I'll leave most of that to Wraith, but just to say, it doesn't entirely surprise that you're going to have operatives from the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, from the most militant wing of Fatah, carrying out an operation, trying to demonstrate, kind of putting a placeholder for themselves in the context of all this violence coming in the wake of the elections that were not. And from a strictly security perspective, my understanding is that the Palestinian Authority, which has been actually quite a good counterterrorism partner overall, did take its foot off the gas a little bit in advance of the elections that were not in an effort to kind of create some space for diplomatic, democratic election activity, and then resumed its kind of full force counterterrorism efforts after those elections didn't happen. But that in the meantime, that left a, a window, a gap of a period in which multiple groups were able to regroup. I think there are a couple of other themes that are really important here to understand the uh, Hamas piece of this, which clearly for Israeli security officials is the biggest part of this whole conundrum. Uh, one is that, um, as they see it, unlike Guardian of the Walls, this round of violence, which has been planned for quite some time, is very much being driven by the Iranians and is very much being driven by Salah al who used to spend a lot of time in Turkey, now spends less time in Turkey, largely because, likely because of that rapprochement and spends a lot more time and is expected to spend still more time in Lebanon. And if you just look at the meetings in the press that you know, you can see from the open source that he's had with Hassan Nasrallah from Hezbollah, with Iranian officials, and my understanding is he's had meetings with other Iranians who hold less public titles, um, that these meetings are very operational about seeing to their fact that they wanted to have uh, acts of violence during this religious trifecta of Easter, Passover, and the holy month of Ramadan. And I don't think that this is the end of it either. This is an opportune moment where they saw an opportunity for violence, but again, leading up to the one-year anniversary of uh, the last conflict uh, in May. And the last thing I'll say is this. 
I think one factor also is that Hamas leadership is not exactly unified right now. <clears throat> I think you could say that it's three quarters unified. That is to say, Sinwar in Gaza, very close to the Hamas formal military, uh, Hania now largely in Qatar and Lebanon, um, and uh, Aruri uh, in Turkey and Lebanon all see eye to eye, all of them very, very close to Iran, all of them willing to see operational uptick, but all of them agreeing that this uptick should occur strictly in the West Bank and Israel and the hopes that it leaves the Gaza Strip protected and the benefits, the Qatari money, the jobs that passes into Israel are not affected. But there is significant tension with Khalid Mishal, who is now returned uh, and is the head of the external branch. And Khalid Mishal is not against the... Uh, generosity of Iran and is not against violence for that matter, but he is much more attuned to Hamas's Sunni roots. He's the one who kind of is the, the reason Hamas left um, Syria, thinking the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood would be their savior, and that didn't work out quite so well. Um, and there's a significant amount of tension between those four. And the first three are trying to sideline Khalid Mishal a little bit, maybe add a few more seats to the Shura Council that he doesn't control, maybe replace some people that are under his authority with people that are closer, say, to Sinwar. And Michelle also has some capabilities at his hand. And the the practical um, security ramifications of this are that while it's unlikely, unless things really get out of control, that you're going to see rockets or any significant rockets coming from Gaza in this conflict, some authorities are fearful that there could be small numbers of rockets if things get hot coming from Lebanon, not fired by Hezbollah, not fired by PFLPGC, but fired by Hamas activists who, again, you can read about this in the open press, have been fighting with Fatah and others in some of the Palestinian refugee camps and do have small caches of weapons, not particularly large numbers, not particularly sophisticated precision guided munitions, for example, but enough to fire things in to Israel from Lebanon to just signal another front and also for Michelle to say, I have some leverage in here too, even though you, Sinwar, really control or are close with the military wing led by Mohammed Daif and Marwan Issa. So I think that the internal dynamics within the PA, the internal dynamics within Hamas and the, uh, the extreme possibility for things getting out of hand is what we need to look at in the days and weeks to come. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, really useful look at uh, the internal dynamics inside uh, Hamas leadership. Um, Raith, before I turn to you, let me remind you, uh, viewers, if you want to get into this conversation, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom bar if you're accessing on Zoom. And if you're on YouTube or any other format, please email me directly at rsatloff at Washington Institute dot o-r-g. Uh, Raith, uh, let's take a look at some of the other Palestinian dynamics, especially inside the Palestinian Authority and how the uh, the terrorism upsurge is, is affecting what is uh, clearly a fragile situation in Ramallah. All right. Thank you very much, Rob. And <clears throat> thank you, Anna and Matt. Uh, as I said, I mean, I'll focus on the West Bank, um, partly because um, what's happening in Israel is primarily driven by domestic internal Israeli dynamics in terms of the terror uh, originating from Arab Israeli citizens. And as Matt said, Gaza, to the extent that we can ever say that Gaza is stable, is quite stable in the sense that uh, if there is violence, it's going to be directed violence uh, from Hamas. Right now, Hamas doesn't seem to be that interested. Of course, this can change. But for the moment, a combination of what Matt talked about, some of the uh, measures that Israel took, allowing laborers to go into Israel, etc., from Gaza. And the Egyptians are also putting pressure on Gaza, on Hamas, uh, uh, not to escalate. In the West Bank, we see an interesting, uh, you know, almost uh, conflicting dynamics happening at the same time. On the one hand, uh, if anyone in the audience had spoken to Palestinian, Israeli, American, or Jordanian officials in the last two months, you will know that everyone is fixated and focused on the possibility of violence in April. So we've had a lot of lead time to prepare for that. And we're seeing the preparation. You know, Anna talked about a bit about what the Israelis are doing uh, in security terms. The PA security forces have been, since the elections were canceled and after May of last year, have been really going full force, particularly last two months, under um, dismantling Hamas's uh, infrastructure, uh, um, etc. 
Um, we've seen security cooperation uh, intensified. It's been going on for a long time, but it's been intensified in the lead up to this. And we've seen other actors playing. Uh, we've seen the Jordanians, for example. You know, Amman had become uh, almost a Mecca, a pilgrimage place for Israeli officials to discuss this. Uh, the king was in Ramallah. Um, so we've seen, you know, a lot of preparation. It's been, you know, I've never seen this level of preparation in many years. This is almost like arguing for um, stability and mechanisms for dealing with uh, potential flare-ups. On the other hand, we do have an extremely um, volatile situation, a situation where the context itself remains very uh, potentially explosive. Um, if you look at Israeli action, there are enough Israeli action that could trigger uh, something. Uh, ranging from, you know, some of the security measures that uh, Anna mentioned, which, yes, have a security value, but also they add uh, a degree of tension, arrests, etc. Uh, settler violence is becoming more brazen in uh, many ways, but there are also internal Palestinian issues. Uh, uh, Matt talked about the Hamas dimension. You go beyond the Hamas dimension, there are tensions within Fatah. We see this, uh, this you know, strange situation where Abbas condemns the Bnei Barak, uh, attack, while other elements in Fatah praise it. Uh, we see Abbas yesterday meeting with the Fatah uh, activists in Jerusalem to urge for calm, while we see other Fatah activists. So there isn't really, you know, within Fatah itself, there are tensions. But to zoom out a little bit, um, the Palestinian public is extremely frustrated, hopeless. There is no hope. There is a sense of hopelessness. The hopelessness comes both from kind of lack of faith in diplomacy, and so we see more uh, support, if you look at polls, for violence, uh, not for a full-fledged intifada, but for violence. We see a, a, a severe chronic legitimacy crisis facing the Palestinian Authority. Uh, if you look at the polls again, 80% uh, think that the governments are corrupt, 80% want Abbas to uh, resign. This creates a situation where uh, things are volatile, and when you have an authority, the Palestinian Authority, that really doesn't have the moral standing right now, if there is a flare-up to exercise uh, uh, political uh, um, restraint on the public. So we have these kind of two uh, um, uh, dynamics. Again, from a security point of view and from a coordination point of view, I think though we have, the parties have done all that they can do, and the rest uh, is, uh, you know, uh, a lot of it uh, we go back to hoping that things don't uh, spin out of control. Now, within this, um, what does that mean for U.S. Uh, policy? And I will conclude on this. The U.S. actually has been quite uh, engaged in general and specifically um, in the lead up to uh, April. With the new administration, I think we started seeing uh, a re-engagement of the United States with the Palestinians, um, a re-engagement that has been limited uh, by actually legal constraints that we have in the United States here. Uh, we cannot give support to the Palestinian Authority financially as long as they continue the policy of pay for slay. Um, yet we've seen other forms of support. We've seen support to the UNRWA, we've seen support to uh, civil society, to private sector, and we've seen more engagement uh, by the U.S. So in this sense, the U.S. is actually helping diffuse some of the tensions. One part that I did not mention is the economy in the West Bank is not doing very well. American support will uh, uh, help uh, uh, create a better context. Yet, uh, beyond the generalities, though, in the lead up, we've also seen a very significant American involvement when, uh, first of all, the U.S. recently has resumed funding our security coordinator. Coordinator, The U.S. has a three-star general whose job is to uh, um, train and develop Palestinian security forces and to facilitate uh, coordination with Palestinians and Israelis. This was frozen, at least in terms of funding, under Trump. Now it's been refunded. This gives it more, this gives this, uh, that office more ability to engage the Palestinians directly, but also, as it's done in the past, in moments of tension and crisis, can play an important coordination role between the two uh, sides. Uh, we've seen when Blinken was there, highlighting uh, um, some what both parties need to do to avoid the escalation, some of the unilateral measures, home demolitions, evictions, etc. In terms of uh, incitement on the Palestinian side, we've seen direct intervention after the Bnei Brak, uh, attack, where the U.S. reportedly leaned on Abbas to condemn, which he did. Uh, so we've seen actually quite an active and involved U.S. role. As the month proceeds, I think this is a time to uh, keep a very close eye on the situation uh, from the from Washington, both in you know in terms of just uh, continuing to uh, uh, provide uh, input, but also to intervene in the way that they did with uh, Abbas. If there is a crisis, if there is an unhelpful action by 
any side to come in and lean on those sides to, ta to take a corrective uh, action. The U.S. should and does and will continue and hope, hopefully will continue to engage other partners to do uh, positive events, uh, actions with the Jordanians, with the Egyptians. I know they're involved and hopefully they will continue doing this. But also the U.S. should involve some, uh, engage some of our uh, allies in the region who are playing a less than constructive role. If you look at Qatar, for example, Qatar is a country that was just uh, given the status of a, a major non-NATO ally, quite prestigious and comes with uh, uh, quite a lot of goodies. Um, yet Qatar has been playing a very negative role around the, some of these attacks. If you look at the Qatari media, like Al Jazeera, for example, they were glorifying some of these attacks, particularly the Iraq uh, one. So it's important for us as well to lean on some of our allies to ensure that all of them actually act in a way that is constructive, that is in keeping with this. So really, I mean, you know, if you look at it uh, uh, in sum, uh, so far things have been uh, quiet. Uh, hopefully uh, that everyone is invested in maintaining this quiet. Yes, there are a lot of spoilers, but uh, there are ways to counter them. Yet the situation remains extremely volatile, and I think it requires uh, consistent vigilance, at least until the end of Ramadan. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much. All right, so um, uh, I have a bunch of questions, bunch of questions coming in by email. Um, let me first start by by going over some of the uh, the facts of, of what's happened and 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 pose a couple of questions about that. Let's start with the the fact that um, uh, there's ISIS, not Hamas, not Islamic Jihad, but ISIS, uh, the Islamic State, um, uh, was the uh, the source of the first of this series of terrorist attacks. Anna, were Israeli security officials, um, did this come as a surprise that it would be an ISIS um, originating attack? Well, security officials that, I, that I've that i spoken to in, in the past few months um, did say that the Islamic State does still pose a threat. Um, its caliphate may have been destroyed, but the ideology is still there. Um, and not only do you have um, ISIS in, in Sinai, there were uh, several Israelis uh, who joined ISIS, several Israelis who were uh, who tried to join the terror group and, and go via Turkey who were deported um, and then, uh, you know, imprisoned in Israel. They were also like the Beersheba attacker. Um, he was in prison for, ISIS, uh, for supporting ISIS and, and uh, promoting their ideology. But the, the, the attackers in, in Hadera, in, in, who came from Umar al-Fahim, that's something that I don't think the Israeli uh, security forces really expected. What Israel has been seeing uh, recently in, in terms of violence in the Arab communities and, and the guns and, and that are just rampant on the Ar Arab street, I think they were expecting more of a criminal uh, sort of background and not ISIS, a criminal or, or nationalist uh, type of attack, but not ISIS. Um, I think that the fact that it was carried out and, and claimed by the group is a wake up call, not only for the IDF, but really for the Shin Bet and the Israeli police who, um, unfortunately seem to have dropped the ball on, on these attacks, uh, be it Beersheba or Hadera. Um, the attack in Bnei Brak is different. It was not claimed by ISIS. It was carried out by a Palestinian uh, who was able to cut through um, a lock um, on an agricultural gate and drive into Israel. So it's completely different. But I think the fact that the Islamic State is... Uh, returning, I guess you can say, uh, to the forefront of attacks in Israel. And there haven't been many deadly attacks by the group in Israel. I think the last one was carried out in uh, at the Sorota market in Tel Aviv. Since then, we haven't seen any. Uh, I think that that's something that the Israeli um, security forces really have to understand, that when you have such an insane amount of illegal weapons flooded on the street of of a sector of the country that you have to say is, was given up on. Um, the Islamic State is a very dangerous ideology that when coupled with that amount of gunpowder, uh, gun gun power is like we saw in Khadera, absolutely, absolutely deadly and devastating. 
So, Matt, how, how serious is the Islamic State presence? Uh, how widespread? Uh, I mean, it's clearly not Hamas. Um, uh, but have uh, have people not been focused on this uh, adequately uh, recently? The nature of lone offender or small cell terrorism is that, and this is true actually for all kind of terrorism, there's no such thing as 100% success. And when you have much more uh, significant in size and scale and scope threats, it makes sense for the Shinbet or others to be primarily focused elsewhere. Um, it's very, very hard to have 24-7 surveillance, even on people like those who carried out the attacks in Khadera and in Beersheba, who were not unknown to the uh, Israeli security services. But um, leaving aside those who actually left, uh, some uh, Israelis who were still believed to be in Syria and Iraq, some who were believed to have died there, um, Israeli authorities believe that the entire population of Israeli Arabs who adhere to some level of ISIS ideology, not all of whom are at the point of carrying out violence, is somewhere in the range of like 200 people. We're talking dozens, not hundreds and hundreds. And uh, there have already been raids in Um al Fahim and other places uh, related to these. So I'm not saying that it's not a problem. It's definitely a problem. It certainly was a wake up call. I don't know that they kind of dropped the ball. I do think that when you're prioritizing your threats, the ISIS threat had kind of dropped down a few rungs. This brings it back. The fact that two operations claimed by ISIS happened doesn't even necessarily mean that the threat is actually a whole lot higher than it was because ISIS doesn't have any kind of barrier to entry. You will also have people who will carry out attacks because of... We don't know if the uh, Bedouin in Beersheba was angry about issues related to forest planting in Bedouin areas or what, what, what mix of things makes someone angry and that then when they decide to carry out an attack, they realize if they say that they're doing it for ISIS, it'll get more attention and ISIS will claim anybody who does anything. Recall that they claimed the uh, Las Vegas shooting, which had nothing to do with them. I don't think that the ISIS issue is about to be a problem that's exploding on the horizon. I think security services have already uh, started to do what they need to do to get that into hand. I really do put it into the basket of, against the backdrop of all of the things that we've been discussing, and in particular, the very um, uh, significant and ongoing incitement on social media, WhatsApp, Telegram, et cetera, um, you're going to have people who will carry out attacks in the name of your organization, say Hamas, and you're going to have people who are going to act on their own. And Anna's absolutely right. There is a huge problem both of organized crime within the Israeli Arab uh, community and as part of that, of uh, a, a, a proliferation of, of guns, of weapons. There has been some terror connection to some of these, mostly in terms of Hezbollah in the north and several smuggling uh, attempts thwarted recently where Hezbollah was sending guns in uh, and some drugs in in return for intelligence. It's an old modus operandi of those, but there have been a few of those thwarted recently. Uh, but that, I think, is something quite different than what we've seen uh, in the past couple of weeks. Anna, you mentioned earlier that this community um, uh, is one that had been sort of given up on. Uh, now, this Israeli government actually made a conscious decision, I think, uh, 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 um, appropriated uh, uh, quite a bit of, um, uh, of government budget to at least begin to address this. And there was a decision to have the Israeli police act differently than the Israeli police acted last May um, uh, in the um, in the Jerusalem uh, run up to the Gaza conflict. Have we seen any implementation of these decisions um, in the last several months? Um, are police beginning to be more active in uh, Israeli Arab communities? Have we seen any expenditure of funds? And have we seen any difference? Um, Matt, maybe you know about this as well. Have we seen any difference in um, uh, police deployments or police procedures um, in uh, uh, in facing the prospect of um, uh, uh, of, of confrontation in, in in Jerusalem than than we saw a year ago? Anna. Well, I think the police have um, really started to understand the the seriousness of of the situation and therefore um, are acting uh, within communities where they didn't before, um, really cracking down on weapon smuggling, 
uh, be it from from Lebanon, like like Matt said, or in Jordan or in the Sinai, because there is a lot of uh, smuggling attempts via Sinai. Um, I, I do think that the police understand that um, acting in Israeli Arab uh, towns and villages is completely different when you're having to act within larger Israeli cities. Um, and also when it comes to security forces acting in the West Bank, uh, there have been uh, attempts uh, to, to stop police when they're coming in uh, to crack down on, on weapon smugglings in these towns. But I think uh, that there is still a lot of work to do. Um, it's, it's been a year uh, since the last uh, operation, but there has not been um, as far as what I can what I can see and what I can I can uh, speak to, there hasn't been enough uh, work because it takes time. It takes time that when you have, um, you know, years, I wouldn't say a decade, but when you have years of, of just ignoring uh, the problem and, and you have uh, a whole generation that, that's grown up with okay, well, we have free reign. The police are, are afraid to come into our town, so we'll do what we want. Uh, we saw a few months ago um, a drive-by shooting in an Arab town that killed a boy who was on a swing, a five-year-old boy who was on a swing. Um, we, we see these tragic events happening, and I think that that's also uh, what's making not only the Israeli police uh, wake up, but the Israeli citizens in general um, who will be able to put more pressure on the police to, to do more. But you it's going to be a very, very long process. Matt, anything to add on this? No, only other than to point out the fact that, uh, you know, the, the hero, if you will, the police officer who um, uh, tragically died uh, taking down the assailant in B'nai B'rak was a uh, Christian Israeli Arab. And I think that also is, is providing this community with a kind of uh, a, a different look um, at a time that is uh, very tense and um, I do think that Israeli police in particular have uh, really turned a corner on paying attention to the issue of the organized crime problem, which is centered in the Arab Israeli community, but has a very large Jewish organized crime component to it, too. But organized crime, taking organized crime is, 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 not a, uh, is not a quick fix. So we should not expect that even with that turn in um, approach that we're going to see uh, really quick results that are making a big difference in the near term. So let me turn this now to the Palestinian security side of this, uh, Raif. Um, can you give us a bit of an update on the, um, uh, not just the effectiveness, but the reach of Palestinian security forces? I mean, it, 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 it appears as though there are parts of the West Bank where Palestinian security forces don't go. So if there are no go zones in parts of the Arab community in Israel, there may very well equally be no-go zones for parts of the West Bank for Palestinian security forces. Um, correct. Um, again, we see this uh, this kind of uh, almost split screen. On the one hand, in terms of kind of just uh, professionalism, preparedness, uh, training, etc., they've been improving. You know, the efforts that were done by the United state security coordinator, the Jordanians and others, have really brought the Palestinian security forces to a level of professionalization that uh, they've never really had in the past. So that's kind of on the good side. But on the bad side, again, because of the political um, situation, because of the legitimacy crisis, because of, uh, of the splits within the Palestinian body politic, you see certain areas where the PA is simply not governing. Two areas in particular come to mind. Jenin, particularly the Jenin camp, where Palestinian security forces really do not go in. And if they do go in, they have to do it in great force. Uh, some of this is being dealt with, by the way, uh, in practical terms. Until recently, the Palestinian security forces were not allowed to have certain lightly armored vehicles. Now they're being allowed these armored vehicles. This will allow some of their uh, uh, operational capabilities to improve. But the political ability to go into a place like uh, Jenin, especially the Jenin refugee camp, are limited by the fact that they're not welcomed by the population, whether the population is, you know, Islamic Jihad, uh, as we saw in the last uh, Israeli operation there, or even Fatah uh, members uh, who are simply do not feel uh, uh, um, a degree of affinity to the Palestinian Authority. Similarly in Hebron, in Hebron, what we basically have uh, seeing 
is this area has reverted back to its tribal uh, governing structures. Uh, the PA might be there nominally, yet uh, um, uh, daily life is being run by tribes. Um, in a few months ago, there was such a tribal tension and tribal fights, including shootings and killings between different tribes, and the PA security forces were unable to operate. In the end, the PA, to the extent that they could operate, did that uh, on a political level as a mediation level. Uh, this kind of disintegration of reach is something that is very worrying because ultimately, if the model that's uh, that's really uh, kept things calm since the second intifada is the model of security coordination and the PA doing a lot of the security work in these uh, areas, if that collapses, then we're going to start seeing more and more Israeli actions that we saw in Jenin. That means more and more fatalities, more and more uh, friction which are the kind of things that, again, could trigger uh, 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 a downward spiral uh, situation getting out of uh, control. So just for, the, for those of you who don't, who aren't familiar with the map, Janine, the northern part of the West Bank, Hebron, the southern part of the West Bank. So you're suggesting that only really in the center, uh, Ramallah, uh, uh, the neighborhoods and towns around the center of the West Bank, do you have fairly effective Palestinian security operation. And even there, um, refugee camps are a very uh, a special case. There are many refugee camps, including some at the outskirts of Ramallah, like Jalazon refugee camp, where, again, it is a no-go, partly because uh, um, you know the nature, the terrain of the refugee camps is very difficult to uh, operate in, but partly because uh, these refugee camps are really at the forefront of basically giving up uh, on the PA. Now, add to that that you know Abbas, who's not a young man, um, the issue of succession for Abbas is something that's been uh, on people's minds for years now. Some of the competitors are actually collecting weapons, and some of these weapons we see in these refugee camps. So it's becoming even you know some of these refugee camps are more or better equipped in terms of armament than the Palestinian security forces themselves. And we're talking here not only about the periphery, but even in the center again, Jalazon, uh, Nablus, and some of these areas. And so, Anna, let me ask from uh, from your reporting and the perspective of Israelis who are responsible for coordinating with Palestinian security forces, how are they viewing the the level of coordination today, and how is it helping or not helping address the terrorist uh, surge that we've been seeing? Well, I think it definitely helps um, in every way when there's coordination. Uh, between Israel and the, and the Palestinian security forces, uh, we saw that when when there was a breakdown in that, there was a rise in violence. Um, the Palestinian security forces have several times stopped uh, attacks against Israeli forces, against Israeli civilians, um, and it's definitely seen as a major um, advantage to have it. Uh, I can't think of anybody who would want uh, the security coordination to to stop. Um, uh, and uh, Reith, just while we're on this topic, um, uh, given the PA's financial woes, are, are Palestinian security forces getting paid at the moment? Um, this month, because it's Ramadan, they're getting paid 80% of their salaries. Uh, in previous months, they were pay, getting paid around 50%. So yes, they're getting paid, uh, but uh, not enough, and that kind of contributes to the sense of of, uh, of volatility that we see in there. Okay, um, so let me move to a, a different topic. Um, uh, so this Israeli government is adopting, as a government, a different approach um, uh, than we saw from the previous government or from other governments. There's, as you said, Anna, um, uh, um, uh, no clamp down, um, uh, uh, no um, you know, uh, harsh uh, preventive measures stopping people to move, say, to uh, El Aqsa for Ramadan prayers. Um, um, I think they even uh, uh, exp announced an uh, expanded access for this Friday's prayers. Um, uh, uh, there's a couple. Th this raises a couple of questions. One, what's the politics of this? Um, uh, uh, how is this playing within the government and in the political system? If you want to comment on this, um, Anna, and and two, the effectiveness is this is this having is this resonating the way that it that the the people who are conceiving of this approach um, hope that it is that that it should resonate. So first, Anna, the the development of this policy is is this 
is this controversial? Is this um, uh, dividing uh, the cabinet? Or is this a fairly coherent, cohesive decision to take on the Israeli side? Well, I think in Israel, there's never, you're never going to see full um, cohesion in, in, in the government. <laughs> you'll, you'll never see that. Um, but it's definitely different uh, than under the, the Netanyahu uh, government. Uh, but we do see a lot of uh, opposition, uh, MK saying that uh, Bennett is weak and the government is weak and they're not and it's because of the Bennett government that we're seeing the the outbreak of attacks and um, there, there's a, like there's a lot of politics and a lot of um, I, I, I follow politics less here again I, I, I'm very uh, uh, focused on the security part but when you look at uh, the politicians who are coming out and, and, and speaking up and saying that under Netanyahu, there was no violence and under Netanyahu, everything was under control. Uh, you have to go back in the past and see that, no, it wasn't like that, but this is Israel. And, and when it comes to Palestinian, there are always waves and you always have to find uh, the best policies uh, to stop that and to prevent further escalation. I think that uh, within the government, those who are working on the policies are really trying to, um, bring it to an accepted uh, position within the government. Uh, the security cabinet is meeting on, on Sunday uh, also to, to discuss uh, the coming weeks and to see if uh, what was decided upon today has had any effect um, because that would be a, a week uh, of, of Ramadan, a week of already high tensions in Jerusalem um, and across the country. So we'll have to see. I, I think, uh, again, that the the politicians who are coming out and saying that uh, under Netanyahu, nothing was happening and, and, and the country was safe and there were no attacks are just playing politics, really. Yeah. All right. Um, are we seeing that this policy has is resonating in Arab community, Palestinian community um, so far? It's early days yet. Reif? Look, I mean, first of all, actually, this is in, in in theory, this is not new. Actually, under uh, Gadi Eisenkot, when Gadi Eisenkot was uh, chief of staff, there was a decision by the IDF to basically really have focused responses to terror attacks, as opposed to what we had before. Now, what happened then, though, was you know, the IDF's ability to uh, operate and make decisions was limited by uh, Bibi, who was a very strong and sometimes micromanaging uh, prime minister. Now we see um, Gantz and the uh, IDF and the security establishment in Israel really owning this fight when it comes to the Palestinians. And we see a lot of these ideas that were already floating within kind of IDF conversations becoming uh, more real. Now, this is also, I mean, uh, um, reinforced by the fact that in the U.S. we've actually adopted a new approach to the peace process, um, and I think the wise approach. We abandoned the idea of trying to get a peace deal um, simply because the time is not ripe. Again, uh, different from both uh, Trump and Obama, we have an administration that is focused on these practical issues. So, you know, these are this is a confluence of different uh, factors. Um, look, I mean, first of all, it's too for these things take a while to take hold. So uh, it's too early now to see if they are fully um, effective. Yet we do see anecdotal evidence that these things are popular. That people, if you, again, if you look at polling, uh, that uh, the public is positive to these uh, issues. We do see anecdotally that uh, there is less desire to uh, uh, um, undermine these kinds of advances from Palestinian uh, um, public. Again, if you look at uh, the polls, yes, there is an increase in uh, support for violence, yet there is uh, no uh, real appetite for a full-fledged intifada, specifically for these kinds of, uh, of uh, actions. So there certainly will bias time, but as Matt said, you know, no strategy is uh, foolproof. And I suspect what Hamas and others are doing is they do want to see an escalation where Israel is driven then to uh, to react. Um, I think this is one of the reasons why we're seeing that the current Israeli government is, is maintaining a course. This is the kind of thing that will take time to bear fruit. It is doing in the short term, but it's still at this moment very uh, fragile, and there's plenty of uh, uh, spoilers out there who want to collapse this approach. Matt? All true, but I don't think any of that is what's driving this. I think this is entirely operational in nature. I think the effort here, looking back, comparing to last May, is to avoid 
uh, remove points of friction or flashpoints where you could have someone who wants to instigate something uh, have an opportunity to do that with Israeli security officials. Uh, they understand that Hamas is extremely focused on Jerusalem and are looking for a way to say the Israelis are preventing access to Al-Aqsa, etc. And I think as a secondary piece of this, um, I think both Israeli and Palestinian authority officials are wary of creating a situation where someone is killed and then you have funerals in the West Bank for a period of time, especially after the kind of lull in security uh, in the lead up to the non-election. Uh, there were what some refer to as green protests or green funerals, meaning a lot of green Hamas flags. Um, there was finally one funeral, actually an individual who died of COVID, <clears throat> not in any conflict with Israelis, um, uh, Wasfi Khabha, and there was a particularly green funeral and the PA cracked down. So I think that uh, security officials are seeing this as an opportunity to deny Hamas the kind of points of conflict that it needs and wants. And probably I assume that they have some intelligence insight into that they're looking for to uh, ignite this conflict and they're trying to deny them that kind of dry wood. Interesting. Um, let me ask about um, uh, one specific but very important uh, uh, piece of this, which is El-Aqsa itself. Um, uh, usually or often a flashpoint. Um, uh, sometimes it is um, uh, uh, a contributing factor is the lack of coordination between the Jordanians, the Palestinians, and the Israelis. We've seen an awful lot of effort at Jordanian and Israeli um, uh, coordination in, in, in recent days. Uh, we saw the king go to Ramallah, um, uh, 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 Jordanian-Palestinian coordination. Um, uh, a year ago, this was a problem. Um, are we better off substantially a year later? Uh, okay. Oh, I mean, no, no doubt, no doubt. As as you know, uh, Jordanian-Israeli relations came very close to a breaking point under Bibi. The relation between Bibi and the king were so bad that while the security establishments continued to cooperate and actually kept the relationship alive, at a political level, there was uh, none of that, and therefore. In times of crisis, the ability to do quick coordination was uh, was uh, we lost it in uh, some ways. Things have changed with the new Israeli government. We've seen a very quick uh, uh, warming up of the relationships. Uh, things that have been uh, stuck in the prime minister's desk uh, for years. Uh, Jordanian asks were quickly uh, met. Uh, whether it relates to Jordanian trade with the West Bank. Jordanian-Israeli uh, um, agreements. We saw even Jordanian-Israeli-Emirati agreements. Jordan is getting closer to the Abraham Accords. This has created a degree of comfort for the Jordanians to, uh, to enable them to be more active. And what you described, Rob, is exactly part of this uh, comfort. The fact that we're seeing Israeli officials coming to Jordan publicly. I mean, we always knew that there, there was a lot of traffic, but to actually for the court, the Hashemite court, to uh, publicize tells you how strongly they feel about this relationship. So we are very better, much better off. And of course, a lot of this uh, coordination relates to uh, Al-Aqsa, to the Harb al-Sharif, Temple Mount. Yet, the Jordanian role is contested. It's contested by many factors, by many factions. The Turks have been trying to uh, establish a foothold in Jerusalem for a while, and they are not a, a particularly good actor in that uh, context. The Islamic movement uh, of Israel, the northern branch, uh, has been also making efforts in that direction. Hamas has quite a lot of following in Jerusalem, uh, particularly since the PA and Fatah are not allowed to operate there openly. So, yes, we have uh, uh, you know, cooperation and coordination has uh, uh, increased. And that's why I suspect even if there is a crisis, we at, le at least have crisis management and prevent and uh, uh, reduction mechanisms uh, in place, but there are again other many factors who see this as an opportunity to establish more of a stronghold, and frankly, who have an interest in minimizing or uh, weakening the Jordanian uh, position uh, in Jerusalem. And so, Anna, just just on this, um, uh, uh, Minister of Defense Gantz went to Amman, uh, but uh, there was reporting, at least, that uh, when he wanted to see the king in the West Bank, when the king was in Ramallah. He was prevented from doing so by uh, his boss, the prime minister. Could you uh, give us some 
uh, an eye into this? You know, what what explains the politics slash security interests and differences among Israel's leadership on this issue? Well, Gantz has had um, a very interesting relationship with Bennett in the past uh, few weeks. Um, it kind of seems that he wants to um, have more of a, of a say and have more of an influence uh, than he thinks he does right now. Remember, he was supposed to be the alternate prime minister, and that never happened. And now Lapid uh, will replace Bennett, and, and, and Gantz won't ever be prime minister. And I think that he's taking that to heart. Um, but at the end of the day, Gantz did meet uh, with, uh, with the king, um, and he did have the approval of Bennett at the end of the day. But there is uh, there is tension between Bennett and Gantz, and it's going on. It's been going on for for a while now. It also had to do when um, Gantz announced that he was going to India, um, and then Bennett said, "Okay, I'm going to India." Uh, also, when it came to Bahrain, uh, Bennett uh, Gantz went to Bahrain, and then. Bennett went to Bahrain. So it, he really wants to, to show that he is also working very hard um, to bring some sort of stability to the region, uh, to bring in uh, other countries of the Abraham Accords, uh, to work together to bring security uh, against Iran, um, and also to help uh, with the Palestinians. Um, he has been uh, working with countries, uh, even Egypt, a lot more than in the past uh, than that previous Israeli governments have done, the previous defense ministers have done. Uh, so I think that he wants to, you know, put his flag and say, I'm doing my job and I'm doing it well and I should have been prime minister. I think that's where the tension is coming. Interesting. You know, it's, it's uh, for those who try to follow Israeli politics, this is a fascinating turn. One would have thought there'd be tension between um, perhaps uh, Benny Gantz and Yair Lapid. Who used to be partners and then had this the great falling out. Um, uh, but uh, you're identifying uh, tension between Benny Gantz and the current prime minister, not just the future prime minister. But there could again be tension when Lapid becomes prime minister. Uh... Uh, when, w- when and or if. Yes. 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 <laughs> um, so Matt, uh, a couple of issues have come up that I wanted to ask you about. Um, uh, uh, Raith mentioned earlier the Turkish role in Jerusalem. And I know that you um, earlier in the conversation um, referred to uh, Aruri in Turkey. Um, uh, there's also been a bit of a switch on Turkey's position vis-a-vis Israel in the last uh, period of time. Do we see any mellowing on what the Turks might be trying to do to, to uh, um, uh, 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 throw oil on the fire in Jerusalem? Are they less likely to be um, arsonists in Jerusalem today? So the people I spoke to uh, really do think that the rapprochement between Israel and Turkey uh, is moving in a serious direction. Uh, Nobody thinks that that's going to lead to shutting down the Hamas or Hezbollah offices in Turkey, but it probably will lead to, in fact, it already has started leading to the departure, at least as full-time residents, and uh, they're hoping complete departure of some of the most egregious figures, including Salah al-Ruri himself, who spends a lot, a lot more time in Lebanon now. But Turkey is still an important operational meeting point, especially in terms of overseeing Hamas West Bank operations. And as we discussed, for Hamas leadership in the Gaza Strip that wants to see an escalation, they don't want to see it in Gaza, they want to see it in the West Bank. That's giving Aruri, the backing of Sinwar and the military wing. And so it shouldn't surprise that, what was it, about three weeks ago, the Israelis arrested several people in East Jerusalem, including someone who's believed to have been responsible, specifically tasked by Salah al and his deputies at a meeting in Turkey, uh, where he was given instructions, given some training, given funds to set up a cell uh, to carry out attacks during Ramadan uh, in in Jerusalem. Now, th- four of these people, I think three of them were brothers, uh, were arrested. Um, the assumption is, and it's probably a pretty good one, that the Israelis got a decent amount of information uh, about this uh, from that um, 
uh, set of arrests and, and, and interrogations, um, both about their activities in Turkey, the importance of Turkey, the roles of Salah al the roles that we mentioned of Iran pushing this really aggressively, uh, and probably some pretty good intelligence on the types of plots and the types of situations that Hamas is looking to take advantage of to create tension and violence in Jerusalem. That doesn't mean that they'll be able to thwart everything, but it probably means they've got to put some pretty good insight into what they're doing, which is why I'm led to believe why I think that things like removing Israeli soldiers to the extent possible from points of friction is probably primarily an operational decision. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a security complement to shrinking the conflict. That's what all security would like to do, but security doesn't operate in a vacuum. And so something like the diplomatic uh, breakthrough, uh, which, and I really think it would be a breakthrough of, of a rapprochement with Turkey, even if it's not the warmest of relations, could have some very positive um, turns. So, um, uh, Raith, a few moments ago, you, refer, you referred to the Islamic movement uh, uh, in northern Israel as being an instigator of um, potential conflict on uh, uh, the Temple Mount and Al-Aqsa. Um, I want to ask um, anybody who want to comment on um, uh, one of the leaders of the Islamic movement of southern Israel, namely Mansour Abbas, um, uh, um, who has been quite vocal in his condemnation of, um, uh, of the terrorist uh, surge. Um, and, with, and perhaps he's been vocal, has been one of the reasons some of the other Arab-Israeli leaders have also been vocal, um, because I've seen some other very strong comments. Is this sort of virtuous cycle of condemnation, um, is this a uh, having a positive impact? Can we see that that this is perhaps one of the reasons why we're not seeing the, um, uh, the, the outbreak of violence in the Arab-Israeli communities, the mixed cities that we saw a year ago? Um, uh, um, do we see any resonance of these statements? Okay. I, I don't like to talk about Israeli politics, but in this case, because just because I think Mansour Abbas is just doing such a courageous thing uh, and potentially, uh, you know, a game changing uh, thing. Um, and by the way, I would also add he's not the only one. Uh, Isawi Frage is another uh, cabinet minister from Meretz who's also been very uh, vocal. Okay, no doubt that it is creating a momentum, at least within the political uh, classes, when we saw from other Palestinian and Arab-Israeli MKs, some of the reactions you know, were spurred by Mansour Abbas. But on the other hand, I would have to assume that uh, when you have such a shift in the way that thing business has been done for so long, there will be people who will uh, lose uh, out of it. There will be people who will feel uncomfortable. And I suspect part of the context of what we see within the Arab-Israeli uh, community is this tension, this kind of departure of an old model to a new model, it is always disruptive. So I do not, you know, I, I truly believe there is a positive impact with these statements, but I have no doubt that also some of the tensions that we see are a result of the shift of uh, approach, really changing 70 years of the way they do politics. Um, I have a number of questions basically on the same theme, which is, uh, should we be ascribing any causality or trigger to Iran for anything for for this recent spate of terrorism. Uh, leaders of the IRGC have have said, you know, they want to cause as much mischief for the Israelis as possible. As Ramadan um, got underway, uh, um, is that uh, just talk? Do we have reason to think that there is um, uh, an Iranian finger on the trigger, as it were, in any direct or indirect sense? Anna, do you know if? Uh, if Israeli security officials believe so, and do we have any analytics that that might uh, that might impact on this? I think that security officials are always looking um, behind every attack. Uh, who might really be the one, um, like you said, pulling the trigger? Uh, it could be that uh, you know, like like we were, we, we have all heard uh, throughout the panel uh, this evening that. Hamas is, is uh, really trying to uh, be close with Iran, um, also be close uh, with their with their cells in the West Bank, and it could be that uh, Iran is uh, pushing them to to carry out more attacks uh, than before uh, during uh, the the three holidays. But I don't think uh, that it's only Iran. Um, 
again, you know, it's it's not only Hamas that are pushing these attacks. It's not only Fatah. The, you will also have the lone wolf attacker who will come out, who will say that, you know, uh, my day just didn't go well today. Um, my my wife has left me or there are financial issues or whatever um, problem that there could be and carry out an attack. And there won't be any uh, group or country behind it. Uh, there is also um, a lot of, of worry about um, Hezbollah having more of a, of a, I would say, inspiration um, in, in Israel. There is uh, support uh, here and there within communities. Will, he, will we see an attack uh, like we have uh, in the past by Hezbollah? Unlikely. Um, but I, I think that the Israeli security officials, uh, when it comes to Iran, are really looking in every single which way possible to make sure that an attack um, by uh, a state actor isn't carried out. Matt, anything further on the Iran angle? Yeah, it, it really struck me how even more than in the past, um, authorities believe that this round of violence planned for the religious trifecta over the month of Ramadan and leading up to the first anniversary of Guardians of the Walls, in part coming against the backdrop of um, tangible you know, uh, benefits of the Abraham Accords, uh, that this has really been driven by Iran. It's true that you know Israelis will often point to Iran, but not the way um, I've experienced it this time around, very tangible, specific meetings with specific people, um, dates, places, uh, all of which uh, is believed to be operationally themed. And I, and I do think that at least part of their certainty on this comes from things like uh, the arrest of Khalid Sabah in Jerusalem and others where they were able to get information by, from people who participated in some of these meetings. Yeah, before I go to Raith on this topic, um, one person sent me a note, sent me a question. Um, we, uh, we've, we've two or three times used the the, the phrase, uh, you know, the trifecta of the three holidays. Um, and, and this person asks, so what? Um, uh, uh, yes, you know, Easter comes every year. It's always the same time as Passover. Um, uh, why, why is it more likely to have a, um, uh, uh, an add-on effect on, uh, on violence and terrorism? So the holy month of Ramadan is typically a period when Islamist groups like to increase their operations. And when you have those years where the three holidays literally intersect, you have a lot more Jewish and Christian tourists uh, in the old city, uh, a lot more attention and it typically raises the concern of security officials. Uh, but absolutely, if you didn't have the three uh, religious holidays um, all happening around the same time, we'd still have the vast majority of these tensions. Um, but one of the reasons, as Wraith and Anna have said, that you've had such cooperation in the months leading up to this, everybody's been looking to April. This is why. Okay. Wraith, um, on the Iran angle? I just, I mean, um, I have no doubt that Iran has been trying to work very hard with Hamas and Pidge uh, to push this. But I want to point out that Hamas's ability to impact the public in terms of messaging is actually limited. I mean, Hamas is not very, I'm sorry, Iran is not particularly popular in the Palestinian side. We have to, you know, remember that Palestinians are, you know, Sunni Muslims, uh, Sunni Arabs as opposed to Shia Persians. And the same kind of, if you wish, what you mentioned, Matt, about uh, Mishal feeling a degree of discomfort with this relationship, you feel uh, in a more social uh, level. So yes, uh, Iran will continue pushing and it will have its uh, supporters, particularly in organized groups, yet its ability to shift uh, narrative is uh, limited. I would look, I would be more worried in terms of, again, shifting the narrative towards the more Sunni Islamist uh, world. And again, not Daesh here, not ISIS, but more the traditional Islamists. And that's why I, I concluded what I said with mentioning Qatar. I think the kind of messaging we're getting from the religious uh, activists, religious movements that have resonance with the Palestinians, namely Muslim Brotherhood and that kind of uh, orbit, is the one that I'd be more worried about. All right, as, we, um, as we're about to bring this conversation to a close, I just want to ask all of you what we, collectively we, should be looking out for in the next several weeks. 
Are there other dates, triggers, events um, that uh, um, uh, that that people should be mindful of as we think about the prospect of of, uh, of violence? Um, uh, um, are there opportunities to to um, to do things in a more positive sense? That uh, uh, meetings, uh, um, uh, opportunities that uh, of, of leaders or peoples. And anything on the calendar in the next several weeks that people should be keeping an eye out for. Uh, Anna? Um, well, actually, as we were we were talking, I got a, a message from the defense ministry saying that uh, Gantz has just met, uh, has spoken with Abbas uh, to congratulate him on Ramadan and, and, and to thank him uh, for condemning the attack in B'nai Barak. And I think that um, more meetings like this um, will help the situation. Um, I think that the dates that we have to look for, I think is just really uh, towards the end of the month, we have to you know, wait out this month, see that nothing, um, uh, not, no violence continues, that the, the moves and the steps that uh, the Israeli security forces are taking um, will, will help. Uh, I think that uh, also, um, the, the soldiers that have been stationed along the seam line, um, if they're able to, to keep the situation uh, calm, uh, not be too trigger happy, um, will definitely uh, calm the situation. Being trigger happy and being uh, scared uh, together could, could cause a, an unfortunately a major incident that can set all of this off uh, once again. Um, in terms of uh, possible dates that could be uh, that could be of concern. Really, I, I don't think that there will be any attacks. Uh, you know, over over the Passover holiday, uh, when it, 20 years ago, Israel carried out Operation Defensive Shield, which was the largest military operation in the West Bank um, in decades, and that that what set that off was the the Park Hotel bombing in. in Netanya, um, which was carried out by a Palestinian suicide bomber during the Second Intifada. I do not think uh, that we will see that. I do not think that Israel uh, will carry out Defensive Shield 2022. Uh, we're not there. Um, there will not be a Third Intifada. Uh, nobody wants it. The Palestinians don't want it. The Israelis don't want it. Uh, I think that working uh, the security forces, the Palestinian security forces and the Israeli security forces, if they're able to continue that uh, security cooperation, that's a, that's a key, a key factor in, in keeping the, the street calm. So isolated, perhaps periodic terrorist uh, events, but no third intifada and therefore no uh, massive clampdown. You agree? That certainly is everybody's hope and I think everyone's expectation. Uh, I think that uh, other than uh, the holy month of Ramadan, uh, I think people are looking uh, towards the anniversary uh, in May of uh, Operation Guardians of the Wall and they're concerned about anything and everything Jerusalem. Uh, you know, you wanna see a sign that Hamas doesn't really does not want to see any type of flare up at Gaza. There were land organized land day protests in Gaza they were nowhere near the border. They were off at the port, other side of the Gaza Strip, let people, you know, let off steam over there, but it was nowhere near the border where you might've thought it would otherwise be. So I think there's reason to really believe that Hamas certainly in Gaza doesn't want things to get so out of hand that Israel feels the need to retaliate against Gaza. And therefore they're looking for things to happen. They want things to happen in a way that will seem anyway to be organic. And uh, if Israeli officials, as Anna say, can kind of keep things uh, calm in part by keeping calm and uh, creating space, um, then hopefully, you know, the, the um, our religious holidays go um, quietly. And then I think the likelihood that we see any type of flare up significant flare up is rather small. I don't think anybody's talking about a third intifada, but I can see a hundred different ways where something goes wrong and someone gets scared and pulls a trigger or whatever. And suddenly you have some projectiles coming in from Lebanon. You have some other things happening in East Jerusalem or the West Bank. Like the, 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 the potential for calm doesn't mean that it will be calm. So let's just put in a, a vote for hope. Okay, thank you. And Reif. 
Um, two points. First of all, just a reaction to something Matt said. It's amazing what you said about uh, Hamas in Gaza. I mean, it's, it's exactly what the PA security forces do when you have a demonstration. You block them from going to the, to the tension points. So uh, Hamas is doing exactly what the PA security forces are doing in terms of security coordination. But I hate to kind of end up on a, on a less optimistic note. Um, and I look, I mean, I, I, I agree with uh, Anna and uh, Matt. There is no appetite uh, for a third intifada, yet the situation is extremely volatile. We've been focusing really on the uh, security components of this conversation, and these are, of course, key components. Yet there is a volatility in the situation, a volatility created by the economy, the legitimacy crisis, the uh, situation in the West Bank that you see hopelessness and you don't really see forward uh, motion. And in these kind of situations, anything could be a trigger. In many ways, the kind of uh, uh, calendar dates are my least worry, because when you have a calendar date, you prepare for it. I'm more worried about the trigger-happy uh, soldier, about uh, the lone offender, about a car accident uh, that can spin out of control. So as we, you know, once we uh, hopefully pass Ramadan uh, safely, I think we need to double down on both the kind of shrinking the conflict. I don't like this terminology, but really the approach that the administration and the Palestinians and Israelis have been doing, but also focusing on how do we uh, deal with the issue of the legitimacy crisis within the Palestinian political system. Because unless you start moving towards that, you will not have the kind of center of gravity that will hold if things start uh, disintegrating. So yes, I am hopeful. Yes, I don't see the signs, but uh, I'm still worried because the situation, you know, People don't want the third intifada until it happens. And let's make sure that we uh, deal with the context that is creating this volatility. A cautious note, uh, very appropriate. Thank you. So Anna Akronaim, Matt Levitt, Rethel Omari, thank you very much for helping to explain uh, the current spate of terrorism and, and uh, some uh, ideas about where we may be headed. Thank you very much for joining us on uh, at the Washington Institute. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, everybody, thank for being you. here. Bye-bye, everyone.